Okay. So once again, we are now recording this webinar. So welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. A couple things, I just want to do some Zoom best practices for those who may not be familiar with this particular platform. Um, first is going to be please mute yourselves um, so that we don't get the background noise. If you want to participate, ask a question, put in a comment, we absolutely welcome and hope you will do that. The easiest way is just to hold down your space bar to unmute yourself rather than finding where you are and clicking unmute. You just hold the space bar down that will unmute you for as long as you're speaking and then you can just lift it back up again when, um, when you're done. Second, um, I know we all like to hide behind our screens, but it does make it a lot nicer for everybody um, if folks could have their video on. To do that, it's an icon down at the bottom left of your screen that says start video. If you just click on that, it will go ahead. Um, if you choose to have a different background, feel free. Um, I can teach you how to do that offline uh, if you don't know. But it's, th and thank you all for her doing that. Um, the chat function is set up that you can chat to individuals or you can chat to everyone. So if you want to say hi to somebody through chat, by all means, go ahead. Just be careful that you make sure that you are um, directing that at an individual and not to everyone. If you have a question as we're going through, we absolutely hope you will ask it. Uh, we encourage that, we like it, it makes it much better for either to have comments or questions as we're going through. You can do that either just by unmuting yourself and jumping in or send it through the chat box. I will be monitoring the chat box for questions um, and we'll be happy to bring those up as soon as they come through. I know Gerald, you are a big fan of the chat box question. So go ahead and keep, keep using that. Uh, in view, in, uh, in Zoom, you have a choice between what's called. Just lost you. Lost you. She froze and then went away. Yes. That's crap. Is everybody else still on? I am. Or shake your head if you're on. I thought it was just me, but. No, it's just Marissa, I guess. Marissa, can you hear us? Okay. Back. Back. Am I back? You're yeah. back. Oh, phew. Okay, I was about to just, I was gonna come out now. Okay. So I, sorry, I don't know where I left off, but I was saying that you have a speaker view or gallery view up at the upper right hand of your corner. Um, whichever you prefer, you can pull that in or out. If you want to um, pin somebody who's speaking, you can do that uh, from that view, that view as well. Ellen is going to be using a PowerPoint throughout the webinar to kind of have the rules up that we're talking about and some of the other issues. You can, um, Fix the size of that to bring more people on if you want or fewer. Um, you just drag the window from the right hand side with your cursor. And I think that's about all of my Zoom best practices. Any, if anybody has any others you want to throw in there, feel free. Um, so, what Today's topic, as you all know, is uh, we're moving on to ethics. So we, I asked Professor Ellen Yarshevsky to join us because you know, anytime you do any research on prosecutorial ethics, her name always comes up. She's a nationally renowned expert in the field. She's written um, in ethics in the criminal system, both from the view of the prosecutors as well as from defense. She's a very well sought out um, expert from all sides of the courtroom. And so I was very, very pleased that she agreed to do this with us. So um, some of you filled out the survey that we sent out ahead of time, and we appreciate that. So she's got some feedback already on where you are. What we want to cover today are um, some, some of it will be kind of basic and review for some of you uh, in terms of best practices of the setup of a conviction integrity unit, what some of the evidence rules, uh, ethics rules, excuse me, that we all need to keep in mind are, and then we'll be moving into some of the more kind of graduate level ethics issues, if you will, in terms of cooperations and working particularly with pro se defendants. So Professor Yaroshevsky, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining this. And I'm gonna turn it off to you and mute myself. Thank you so much, Marissa. And thanks to all of you. Please call me Ellen. Uh, with that introduction, I hope I'll be able to uh, impart some good practices and help you as you try to na navigate some of the difficult issues that come up in both um, running and conviction integrity units, working with innocence projects, dealing with pro se clients, thinking about conflicts, a wide range of issues 
that ma many of you confront. Um, we're not going to be able to get through everything today, at least I don't think so. When we saw your feedback, which was terrific, I realized we could do like a four or five hour pro program on this. And so we're just going to start today with two and maybe in the future um, there, there will be some follow up. Um, among the things I decided to actually put on the back burner for today was working with law school clinics because it didn't seem that that was a major issue for most of you. Um, but if though those issues come up, fine. I don't want this to be a lecture. Um, even though I put together a PowerPoint, it really would be nice if this could be a version of an interactive program. The problem, you know, is you have to unmute yourself and you talk, but Mar Marissa is going to monitor the chat room. So Marissa, interrupt at any point um, to ask, ask qu questions. Um, I tried to put these slides in some order to cover some basic issues first. Um, but there's obviously an, an interaction among, among the slides. So we're not, I'm not going to be rigid about go, going through this. Um, let me just see. And so I'm going to put up the, the PowerPoint. Let, let me just say that I'm happy to send it to you if you think that, that that's something that, that, that would be helpful for the future. Because what we try to do was to put together um, many of the bit basic issues we are talking about. So. This is very nice. Now it doesn't even work to start. What the heck? Okay, issues for discussion. So we're gonna talk about the conduct of reviews and some of the issues that come up there. Um, dealing with people who are pro se, working with innocence organizations. Many of you um, indicated that among the big questions, which are always the big questions, are sharing information, getting waivers, um, and then innocence organizations themselves. What kind of disclosures do they need to make to clients? And as I said, the last one is going to be working with law school clinics. And Marissa put up this beautiful picture um, for us to think about. The, the, she, she put in all the, the beautiful parts of the slides. I just did the basic part. Um, so he, he, here's the independence, okay? Here's the independence. So I think you all know, know this. And this comes about um, from lots of work that's been done uh, beginning, you know, in ten, 10 years ago, when the first conviction integrity units were, were set up, you know, uh, my, my background is I worked with Barry Sheck for many years, having started the Innocence Project way back when he and I were running a criminal defense clinic before the Innocence Project. And we then went off to create an ethics center there. And then he went off and did innocence work full time. Um, and since then, we've been working on a wide range of issues and setting up conviction integrity units. I actually worked on the New York Task Force report, um, which is resourced at the end. And we spent an inordinate number of hours, so I would, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks, trying to come up with a decent template of how we should, in the state of New York, deal with conviction integrity units. Um, because obviously not every jurisdiction is a large jurisdiction. We have tiny communities of a thousand people with the DA, and obviously they can't create the same kind of conviction integrity unit that larger um, cities and areas can. So we dealt with a wide range of different issues and came up with a report that is modeled to a great extent on what Quattrone did. John Holloway some year, years ago um, came up with what we're looking at. We're looking, we're looking at best practices. We're looking at strategic considerations. Um, people tend to think of this program as an ethics program, which is fine because you can get ethics credit too. But I th the ethics rules are really the floor of how we have to operate. And what conviction integrity units um, pose are problems way beyond the floor. They're uncharted problems oftentimes, because when you're thinking about prosecution ethics or defense ethics, the notion of having a conviction integrity unit um, is not something that's typically contemplated. So we're going to be talking about some of the some of the uncharted territory using the ethics rules as a baseline. So the first thing is obviously the conviction integrity unit has to be independent, and people think of that in di di different ways. So first of all, it should be someone who reports directly to the district attorney and not not reports to what is going on here. Okay. Oh boy. Okay, um, so should not be reporting to an appellate unit or any kind of a post-conviction unit within an office. Um, it may depend obviously upon the kind of structure you have in your office as to whether or not that's even possible, but at least ideally you don't wanna be controlled by the people who are handling the, the cases on appeal. 
Right. The second uh, piece of independence is leadership and resources. And so we went back and forth when we looked at this is who should be the leader of a conviction integrity unit. You know, it would be great if it was someone who had been on both sides of the aisle, who has done defense work as well as prosecution work. But actually what it really amounts to is someone who is open minded, who can start a case from an open-minded perspective and not from the perspective of upholding that, that, that conviction, someone with sufficient experience and someone who has the respect of the community. Um, one of the things I wanted to indicate from seeing your, um, your answers is that so much of this is ba based upon trust, that the good conviction integrity units of which there are many set up their policies and practices such that the leader is a person who's done that effectively. And the leader is someone that defense lawyers and innocence organizations can trust. Um, and I, I can't overemphasize that enough. Um, one of the problems is there are places where there are what, what people call conviction integrity units in name only. Um, and that is for a whole host of reasons, not the least of which is they're really not led by, by somebody who has any sense of in, independence of the individual office and there are very few protocols that, that are published. There, there, there are really very few policies. So I think the trust question is a key one. Um, and I'm assuming m most of you are on this because you're already in a position of having established trust in your own co communities. Another piece is how do you guard against confirmatory bias in the staff that you hire? Well, it, it's confirmatory bias that exists not just in conviction integrity units, but obviously throughout any kind of office, prosecutorial, defense, or whatever. Um, and what, one of those is obviously ensuring that you have some form of diversity, and not, not just by race and gender, et cetera, et cetera, but by background. People who have come from the defense would, would be very helpful if you could hire defense people to wor work in your office, as well as people who have good reputations as prosecutors throughout the, their careers. Resources and training, another key piece. Um, obviously, there has to be ongoing training. There has to be initial training. People have to be provided with enough sufficient, enough and sufficient uh, resources in order to reinvestigate cases. You have to have investigators. You have to have the capability to ensure that when you undertake a case, it's actually um, well resourced or at least sufficiently re resourced. The question of um, people from the underlying case. I saw that mo most of you. Um, do not include people from the underlying case in any part of your review. Um, obviously, there are cases where you need to go talk to the trial lawyer or you need to go talk to the appellate lawyer to find out certain information, to get their file for sure, to get what's missing from their file and to ask questions. But when we talk about excluding them from the underlying case, it really is excluding them from having any influence really over decision making in, in the case. Uh, the next one, and, um, and th this ought to be publicized, and you, this is hard, but this is, um, you have to have a clear policy. If you find that the prosecutor on the case engaged in form of misconduct becomes pretty dicey, I think, as to what you do with that information. Um, if you're reporting directly to the DA, that's something that you would obviously talk to them about clearly, but there needs to be in place a policy such that the trial assistant that you're reporting, the appellate lawyer that, that you're reporting from engaging in some sort of mi mi misconduct, one, knows, knows that they're being accused. They have to have some internal kind of re remedy to be able to um, defend themselves if need be. So there should be an internal process. Um, there's a harder question as to whether you report externally. That's really not most likely the responsibility of the person who's the head of the CIU, it's most likely the responsibility of the DA, him or herself, to decide are there circumstances such that we are going to re report out. Um, I don't know if you're aware, there's some recent cases in New York, there's a lawyer in Suffolk County named Glenn Kurtzrock um, who was fired uh, ultimately, and partly it was a result of the judges getting involved, indicating he engaged in misconduct but it was also in connection with some of the work that was done by their new Con Conviction Integrity Unit person who's terrific, who came from US Attorney's Office, Howard Masters. And so um, 
there's a question of, I mean, short of coming out so publicly and firing somebody, what is it that can be done in order to ensure that there's a clear policy within the office re regarding re referring misconduct? I don't know why I'm having such a hard time. Okay. Um, I, I do not know why these slides are moving. It is not because I am pressing the button that, that they move. I don't know what's going on. Okay. So the other structural consideration, and many of you have asked questions about this, is you have to have standards that are somewhat flexible. So what's the standard of the cases that you will review? You're going to review every single case that comes in? Obviously not. You're going to review a case when there's some credible evidence, when there's material evidence, what what is the standard that that you have and is it the same standard in every, every single case or you're just interpreting it differently um, in a bit i'm going to put up the slide on our ethics rule 3.8 g and h which is the ethics rule that we adopted for post-conviction re review um, and it has a pretty low standard for for review and uh, prosecutors have spent a long time in new york debating whether it's sufficiently high or not sufficiently high but it seems to me what's really important is some kind of a consistency in terms of what that standard is and announcing it. Um, the scope of review, um, are you gonna review everything about the case? You, you, and how, how far are you going to go? Um, that, is it gonna be every count in the case? Is it going to be, you know, let, let's say there's a lesser count in a, in a homicide case, there's a manslaughter possibility, how far are you gonna go with that? Um, Review these are, whoops, review on the factual merits. Um, there's a question of you're going to review it even if the sentence has already been completed. Um, that was our recommendation. I can see resource questions with respect to that because if you have a number of cases coming in, it seems to me you'll probably want to prioritize the cases where people are still in prison. But there may be cases where um, it's significant in terms of. Uh, the sentence has been completed, but it would be helpful for this particular person to get some resources if there's the ability to obtain some money. And so you might want to undertake a case uh, where the sentence has already been completed and bump that one higher up in the chain of the cases that you're going to re review. Um, one of the most important points, I think, and I think you've all adopted this, but I just want to emphasize it anyway, um, the standard for review is not newly just the same as the legal newly discovered evidence. Um, we, um, we have had a debate in New York when we um, and our ethics committee were adopting a, a, um, an opinion as to what the standard should be. And there were numbers of people who argued the newly discovered evidence standard, which is to say, um, if the defense could have found the information with due diligence, then we're not going to review the case. That is not the standard re recommended. It should be that even if the defense could have found this with due diligence, that the case should still be reviewed if there is sufficient quantum of evidence that, that is brought to you to suggest that you, you review it. Um, and it shouldn't just be newly discovered evidence, it should be information. So if there's any information in a case um, that, that comes to you or that, or that you look to and say, we should conduct further investigation, um, that one, one should proceed to do that ra rather than say a defense lawyer could have found it. Obviously, many of these cases, you have ineffective assistance. You have defense lawyers who did, shall we say, less than a competent job. Um, and perhaps any lawyer could have discovered it with due diligence, but this lawyer did not. So that, that, that's important. Um, another one that may be a bit contra controversial is allow people to resubmit their claims. Um, this is not a suggestion that you get burdened down by claims that you have duly considered and rejected, but there may be circumstances in which a person submitted information, they didn't have all the information, something new comes, up, comes along, I mean, not, not only DNA, but maybe a new witness, um, may, maybe new physical evidence. And so there should be a provision and you might wanna make it narrow, but you wanna allow for resubmission of claims. Um, Another question is, to what extent should there be any um, external participation? Which is to say, do you want to keep this within your unit or you're going to encourage a petitioner to come forward and cooperate? I know several of you asked that question about how much cooperation there could be, there should be 
in any given case. And when we get to the information sharing point, I think we can ask more, more questions about that one. Um, uh, and another uh, provision that was, that, that was deemed important is that there should be a flexible remedy to address the wrong, wrongful conviction. There are some circumstances where you really can't file a motion before a court. You have to go elsewhere. You have to engage in other kinds of le legal re remedies, if you will. And so it's important to remain flexible. Let's see if this, OK. OK, um, another category of structural considerations, transparency. I know that many of you said, one, you do have written policies. Two, they clearly are communicated. They're on your website. That's really important. Um, people want to know what's the standard for vacating a conviction. It's typically clear and convincing evidence. Uh, some people want, want to have a higher standard. It, I think most people around the country use that particular standard. Um, question about refiling charges. Um, there are cases, as you know, I'm sure, where prosecutors have insisted that somebody plead to something um, in order to um, have, have them exonerated. Um, and the standard we think should be that you shouldn't refile charges unless there's substantial evidence of guilt of the particular charge. Um, that one tends to be, I don't know if it's con controversial, but it, to me it's b bothersome that people have been required to plead guilty. Um, one of the consequences obviously of that is that they lose the ability to file for any kind of compensation make all evidence available for testing, uh, encouraging open exchange of information. As I said, we'll, we will get, get to talk about that soon um, and outline the categories of information that, that, that are withheld. Uh, the last structural consideration, by the way, these are all contained in both the Holloway uh, report as well as our New York State Task Force report, which is identified at the end of this. So root, root cause analysis, this is really key. If you wanna really prevent error in the future, it is really important to go back and within the office, try to figure out why this happened. How did it happen? Why did it happen? And what can you do to learn from uh, this error, if you will, or intentional misconduct or whatever, but ge generally error so that you develop a culture of learning. There'll be a feedback loop within the office so that you either conduct or have somebody else conduct trainings to avoid this happening in the future um, and come up with policies and procedures in conjunction with, with, with the DA to avoid these kinds of problems. Right. And um, I'm just going to jump in here to say sure. that John Hallway at the center, as most of, and many of you know, helps uh, jurisdictions all around the country with these root cause analyses. We call them sentinel event reviews. And he'll be doing a webinar for us in a few months on that, what it means and how it could benefit your jurisdictions. Great. Um, and I, he, he's doing tracking and reporting as well. I mean, one of the key pieces here is that we know something about what it is we, we are doing. So tracking and reporting is essential. Okay, so here's the rule I was talking about. I'm very proud of this rule. Bruce Green and I were the architects of the rule. It's almost impossible to get a new ethics rule through the ABA, et cetera. Um, but we came up with a rule, the post-conviction obligation of prosecutors. We now have- I get a good connection, I'm trying to better. What? I didn't hear what you said. Doyle? Oh, never mind. I was talking to my wife. I had to oh, move okay. to a different computer. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. I thought you were commending us for the fact that we got this rule passed. That's terrific. Anyway. Well, uh, I am commending you. For no, it's, it's not, believe me, it's like pulling teeth. So we've got, we've, so far we have 15 states now that have adopted it in some form or other. And we're actually, we've just written yet another article, it's gonna be published soon, encouraging both prosecutors and defense lawyers to try to get this rule passed in their state. I will warn you that the US attorneys go around the country, they object to the rule. Uh, they, every time it comes up, they, they file almost the same papers, you know, indicating that they couldn't be bound by this, that it would impose obligations that are unfair, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the, the thing is, this is really, this is not a rule that's going to subject anybody to d discipline, really. It really is for setting standards for what ought to happen. And hopefully it moves the needle so that the operation of conviction integrity units and offices are a little easier. Um, in New York, they were so concerned about it that we built in good faith 
into the rules, which is fine. As long as the prosecutor acts in good faith, there's no reason to be disciplined what whatsoever. So he, here's the standard here. We, we came up with the prosecutor knows of new, credible and material evidence. And we, by new, we made it really clear we don't mean newly discovered. It just means something that they hadn't really looked at in, in the same way before. Um, creating a reasonable likelihood, and that was our standard, that a convicted defendant didn't commit an offense of which he was convicted. So we can play around with what do those standards mean? It means knowledge. It, that doesn't mean you should know. Um, you know, if, if, if the evidence points to it and you don't do anything about it, does that constitute knowledge? Are you hiding your head in the sand? This is what I do as an ethicist. I spend my life talking about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, right? Which is knowledge. What does knowledge mean? What does new credible material means? But hopefully this rule is somewhat helpful in setting a bit baseline. So it says that you should promptly disclose the evidence to appropriate court or authority. Um, jurisdictions differ as to who you report to. Um, and then there's a question about what happens if it's not in your own jurisdiction, you find that there's a conviction elsewhere. So we say, if that's true, you should disclose the evidence to the defendant unless the court authorizes delay and undertake further investigation, make reasonable efforts to cause an investigation um, and determine whether the defendant what was convicted of such a, a, a defend, of such an offense. Hopefully that sets a good baseline for you. For those of you in states that have that rule, I think it can support the work that, that you do. And for others, as I said, I think it would be helpful to pass it. Um, and then after that, assuming you, you conduct your investigation, and then when you know of clear and convincing evidence, establishing a defendant in your jurisdiction was convicted and he didn't commit it, you shall seek to re remedy the conviction. We obviously didn't specify how you do that because jurisdictions did differ. So I don't know if there are any questions on this rule in particular. Um, you have any, any, are there any qu questions, Marissa, or should I just move on? There are no questions in the chat room. I do just want to put out that um, another issue we want to look at in a few months is you know, what happens when the judge doesn't want to go along with the prosecutor's recommendation to reverse a conviction, um, as we've seen happening in Missouri and other places, right. um, because arguably a post-conviction relief is your ethical duty under Rule 3.8, and without it, you're kind of in a quagmire. So we will be looking at that issue, um, again, at a, a topic down the line. Good, and that, that's one of the reasons that we think this rule is helpful because the prosecutor can come in and say, this is my ethical obligation, I have to do this. Um, maybe it will help people like Kim Gardner. We're actually, I'm on the ABA Criminal Justice Section Council, and I'm actually gonna put together a CLE on that very topic about, it's really a separation of powers issue. Um, in many instances where a judge refuses or instructs a prosecutor, if you're not prosecuting this category of cases, you have to file a memo in my court as to why you're not doing it. That, that, that just happened in Virginia. Um, so there are a lot of issues regarding, regarding the judicial be conduct, if you will. Okay, so here now, now let's go to the conflicts within your office in conducting a review. So we've all talked about not having contact with the trial and the appellate lawyers unless it's absolutely ne necessary to get, get the information. Um, we talked about standards for accepting cases, standards for review. Um, I'm gonna leave information sharing for a minute, but let me just talk about this question of office-wide conflicts because of future civil lit litigation. St offices are structured very differently. Some offices are responsible, like the Attorney General's office in New York, both handles cases, they do some, some reviews, and then they also are responsible for defending cases in the civil arena um, against awarding damages. And so what the heck are they supposed to do when on the one hand, they are, they are investigating these cases, but they know that if the case gets overturned, it's gonna cost a good deal of money. That, that is a conflict. I'm not sure how much it exists in other jurisdictions. Um, I think it does exist in the lar larger ones. To say that there's quote, an answer to that question would be quite an overstatement. Um, what they've done in New York, first of all, we have a conflicts review board that issues ethics opinions. So that's one thing is they go there, but they also have set up screening within their office. They're a very large office. And so one side of that screen really doesn't have interaction with the people on, people on the other. That, but that, that's really a theory. 
Um, it's never really been tested anywhere. It hasn't been tested because the Attorney General's office is so large. And I don't think that the New York courts are necessarily going to step in and say there's a con conflict of interest there. So the screens can work um, as, a, as a prophylactic measure. Um, but if you're going to set one up, that they have to be very, very strong screens. Um, I I just, I'm only jumping in to assure folks that we will be sharing this PowerPoint with you, um, along with the resources at the end that Ellen lists um, when the webinar is complete. Okay, and I'm going, look, th this is giving, this is sort of the overview, this is giving short shrift to any of these issues. I will tell you that in our task force, we probably spent three hours talking about this issue of future civil litigation, because how do you, if you're in a smaller jurisdiction, um, and you have to think about funding for the prosecutor's office and the funding comes out of the same pool of money that some of the civil rights cases do. Um, obviously, it's going to have some kind of an impact. It shouldn't, but it does. And so how do you ensure that you're still going to conduct your review independently without having to think about the financial co consequences of the review? So that's, that, that, that is the topic. I don't know for how many people th this becomes an issue. You're lucky if it's not. You're lucky if you can conduct your review without thinking about the strengths. Um, the next one, the conflict, is obviously hiring people from defender organizations and innocence organizations hiring pro prosecutors. So we have, you know, our basic conflicts of interest rules, which are, you know, mind-numbing to read to you, but I will just basically talk about them. So there's concurrent conflicts, well, which is not what's usually going to happen. Concurrent conflicts, you're handling two matters that are in conflict at the same time. You're not going to have a defender uh, working, working in a CIU at the same time that they're, they're prosecuting. That's not going to happen very frequently. We're more likely to face what we call successive conflicts. Someone who once worked in a defender office now comes to the CIU or vice versa, someone who worked in a CIU and now, now goes to an innocence project. And then I'm just going to add uh, in some information about go government lawyers. So I'm going to go to the successive conflict rule. So the rule itself, which is, as I say, this is the floor. This is not the ceiling of best practices. But the, the rule says if a person worked on this case, right, if they worked on the same or substantially related matter, and that gets defined as could they have gotten confidential information and their interests are going to be materially adverse to the interests of the former client, okay, um, you can't do it, although we have screening that, that allows it. Um, what's interesting here in many cases, let's say someone worked for a public defender office, they worked on a case, they now come to the Conviction Integrity Unit, they're working on the very same case. Um, of, so they're not really materially adverse to a former client, they're on the same side of the client. So one, one could claim this rule doesn't even apply. You don't have to work on it. You don't have to worry about it. But what you do have to worry about is a rule about go government lawyers and conviction integrity units are governed by government lawyers. And so what it says is we don't really care if you're switching sides. What, what, what we care about here is if you participated personally and substantially, let me go to the second part. Whoops, I didn't, I didn't put it up here. There is the con converse of the, this part, that if you participated personally and substantially, when you're a public officer, when you're with, with the CIU, you can't go work for a defender agency on that same matter, for sure, um, even if you're on the same side. I'm, I, I should have put the, th the, the part up here that talks about going from defense into government, because it's the very same rule. It's the converse of that. So it says, even if you worked as a defense lawyer on a case and, and you, you did it, and now you go work for the government, the CIU, you're not supposed to be able to do that. Um, and the notion is we want to support gov people going into government. We don't want it to just be a revolving door. You can't do it, but you can be screened off. You can be screened off. So the individual defender who comes to work at the Conviction Integrity Unit on the very same case should be screened off, should be screened off, and you can continue to work on that individual case. Is that clear enough, Marissa? Is that clear enough? Yeah, I think so. And um, you know, obviously, this is an issue that law firms have to deal with quite a bit in terms of conflict okay. issues. Right. Um, so it's certainly not unprecedented. And just if anybody in the unit here, and I'm thinking about you, Amy Maxwell, if 
you have questions about that or need some guidance on that, we'd be happy to follow up with you. Great, and I'm, I'm happy to follow up with anybody too in creating screens. The point, the point of a screen is got to be done when the person joins. You can't wait until the problem comes up and go, whoops, now, now we got some information from them. Let, let's not do that. And again, you have to have a timely screen. I All have right. a question, Ellen. Yeah. Linda. Hi, Linda. Uh, hi. What if uh, you have a person who was in your office, the Innocence Project office, right. and they then go work in a DA's office, um, do, are they off of all cases having to do with our office? Because generally they were part of staff meetings where cases may have been discussed? So the answer would be, it depends who it is. If it's you, it's perceived that the person who's at the top of the food chain participated personally and substantially in every matter because you have responsibility. I know, but I'm just saying, if it's someone low, you know, uh, who's a, I don't know, a lawyer's been there a year or two, participated in staff meetings, did they participate personally and substantially? You know, that, that's a question of how, how you define that. And that, that's always the ju judgment call in these cases. I mean, you don't look, these are rules of reason. At the end of the day, when pe people call me, there generally are no answers. There's no answers. There's no case law. There's no ethics opinion. And so you're calling to say, what's the best judgment of how we do this? Partly it depends upon how risk averse do you want, want to be? I mean, what's going to be the consequence if the defender person participates in the CIU? Is a court going to come along and say, sorry, CIU, you're not going to be disqualified? No, right? Um, are they going to refer someone to a disciplinary committee? No. So, it, and they're going to look to what kinds of practices did you set up, which is to say, did you think clearly enough about this and set forth standards of what ought to happen when a person goes from an innocence project to a CIU? Um, so, you know, I don't think um, one, I think you should be careful, but careful in terms of setting out policies. Is that helpful? Yes, it is. Okay. All right. So now here's a, this is a question that, that comes up um, a lot in terms of information sharing. And I'm going back to sort of basics. Um, I hope I'm not offending anybody or insulting anybody by talking about the difference between ethics rules and attorney-client privilege. So in our ethics rules, you know, we have this ethics rule. A lawyer shall not reveal information relating to representation of a client unless the client gives informed consent disclosure is impliedly authorized or it's permitted because it's one of the exceptions. And we're not going to even talk, talk about the exceptions today. They're really mostly not relevant. Okay. So confidential information, all information relating to re representation, a small subset of that is attorney client privilege. What's attorney client privilege? Attorney client privilege, think of as the five C's if you're going to talk to your lawyers who work for you. First of all, it's got to be by a client to a lawyer in confidence. It's got to be a communication and it's got to be for the purpose of seeking counsel. Why that last provision is there is to deal with the crime fraud exception. If a person goes to a lawyer to figure out like how to, how to, how to commit a crime, that's not considered privilege, right? But, but pri privilege are all of these five C's and they're relatively narrow. So when you're thinking about these questions, the attorney-client privilege is obviously, it's a rule of evidence. And you're gonna think about would a court or could, could somebody, could a prosecutor, could somebody else, could another lawyer force you to reveal this information um, because, because they're gonna claim that it's not privileged. In court, you, you must reveal confidential information. That is to say, if you have information about a witness that's not attorney-client privilege. That's confidential information that you may not reveal without client consent, generally. Uh, mostly these are not, quote, impliedly authorized. So I'm going to focus on client consent. But you can't reveal confidential information until you get the consent of the client to, for, for that, all right? Privileged information, as I said, is a lot narrower. So when you're thinking about the, these distinctions, is, can, can you subpoena this? Should it be subpoenaed? What kind of a document is it? Um, you need to make the distinction between the, the, those two. All right. And I just wanted to um, jump in on that just for a second. Okay. Um, and, and I 
guarantee everybody in the call knows this, but when Ellen's talking about clients, she means former or present clients. That, that communication, that privilege yeah. extends yeah. even beyond the level of the representation. Yeah, I mean, the pri privilege survives death, as Justice Scalia told us many years ago, right? So even when a person's died, they still have attorney-client privilege. Um, and so particularly when you're now thinking about information sharing, and this is, I think we'll mo move to th this next. Marissa, you ha I don't know if you distributed some of the forms. Can you, do you want to do that and put, put those online for people or not? The forms that you had about um, the disclosure to clients and for, former clients, what, what you ought to tell them in terms of information sharing. Right, sure. So Ellen's talking about some um, best practices we've been working on at the center with ethicists like Ellen and others. Um, we're also working with sociologists and linguists to make sure that the language we're suggesting is at the level that would be best understood by clients and best where clients could fully understand if you're not able to do a person in in person meeting with them to talk about issues like waiver and sharing otherwise confidential material. So we have those, we're in the process of putting those together. For those who are innocence organizations, uh, we're working with Lisa Cavanaugh and the ethics committee through the network to try to get those incorporated into best practices. And for those who are prosecutors, happy to share what we have um, as they are. So what the plan is right now is that we will continue to kind of revise those and get them there. but. If you're dealing with pro se defendants and you're from the conviction integrity side, or you have questions from the innocence organizations, please let me know. Happy to work you through, help you work through those some issues. Okay, so th this is one of the key issues that I just want to. I mean, I don't. We don't need to look, look at the rule on confidentiality unless you love to look at ethics rules. Um, and so I don't even need, need need a slide for this at at, at the moment. I'm going to stop sharing for a while with slides. So let, let's just talk about the process by which Conviction Integrity Unit now comes into contact with, with a, let's start with a lawyer and then we'll go to a pro, pro se person, person and says, okay, I want, get, give me everything in your file, right? That, that, that's oftentimes how this starts. And look, depending on the level of trust you have, um, you might decide, I'm gonna, if you're the defense lawyer, I'm gonna share everything except attorney client privileged information or maybe in some cases you want to share attorney client privilege information as well. I mean, the examples I always use in New York, there's the Br Brooklyn unit, Mark Hale, he's one of the leaders around the country set up a unit, you know, in the early days when Ken Thompson set this up, if Barry Sheck would go in and say, I have a client, I have some information they go, come on in, give us everything. He'd turn over everything. They'd have an MOU, a memorandum of understanding. Um, and they would work together very carefully over time, sharing all the information. Prosecutor would share the information with him, or so they said, he would share all the information. And that works fine until you have a lawyer you don't trust who comes along, um, and the prosecutor doesn't trust that lawyer at all. And if they have standards of, of general overall information sharing, that the, all the information goes from the prosecutor to the defense lawyer, how do you guard against misuse of that information? What, I think what one of you asked that question, like what if you're investigating a conviction? Um, what if at the end of it, you're, you're gonna decide you're actually gonna re-prosecute that person because they're not, it, it's not an exoneration. There isn't clear and convincing evidence of innocence, but you're gonna go back now um, and you're gonna go, go to a trial and you, they're gonna be accused of something else, of man manslaughter. So what do you do with the fact that you have all this information now that came from the, the, the defense, right? That's one, one of the big issues. Um, these are not simple questions. Let me just say that. I don't know that in a webinar like this, we could answer them all, but I actually wanna have a conversation to see about how people are dealing with that and the kinds of questions that, that come up, distinguishing privilege questions from conf other confidential in information. There's got to be an understanding, I believe, that the defense lawyer really cannot turn over attorney-client privilege in general, that they shouldn't be doing that without a full, under, without a full waiver by, by the client, understanding that what, if they're going to turn over what the client has said to the lawyer, um, that there are consequences to that, meaning that that pri privilege is going to be forever waived. Um, the waiver forms that Marissa is talking about they're not forms, they're actually checklists. I think they make it very clear to the client um, 
the distinction, first of all, between confidential information and attorney-client privilege and the con consequences that come up if you're actually going to waive everything. So does anyone want to I want to comment on that before we go forward. And feel free to just unmute yourself or raise your hand or chat, whatever you feel most comfortable. Because I think that this gets to be one of the more difficult issues of how do you deal with this and how do you have a policy so that it's it's, it's transparent one, right? And that, that you're 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 operating equally with all people, whether it be the lawyer you trust or the lawyer that you don't trust at all. Who's, com who's, com who's coming in to talk with you. Does anybody want to weigh in on this? Has anybody had this come up in your practices or in your unit? That's interesting. So I don't know what, what the practice is. If you have a memorandum of understanding of you're turning over con confidential information, um, it shouldn't be used outside the relationship between the Conviction Integrity Unit and, and, and the defense lawyer. Um, what do you do if you're the defense lawyer and, you know, here's a question. You have an information that is not all that. You think the person's innocent. You have some information, though, that may actually uh, suggest to the prosecutor, to, to, to most prosecutors, that actually they're not so innocent. Do you turn everything over immediately? Do you wait to turn that over? How do you deal with that? Lynn, did you ever confront that? I'm asking you to... I'm calling on people as my law, my law professor mode. Uh, I'm reluctant to turn over everything to DA's offices all the time. I don't, I would not say we have a written policy as to how it is that we proceed. We have worked with several different, what those offices call conviction integrity units. Right. Um, none of them have, with one exception, have been what I actually think a conviction integrity unit should be. So I haven't been as eager to go in and lay out all the cards on the table and say, let's share, because I don't think I'm getting shared with that way. And that certainly isn't what they're representing. Um, so we haven't, we haven't really been confronted with a situation where I feel like we're withholding information that they need to know in any way yet. Okay. You were, I mean, I don't know if you were the, I'm glad I called upon you because it points out this whole question of trust, because if the conviction integrity unit doesn't have uh, policies, and if they're just, as you say, conviction integrity units in name only, it becomes prob problematic. And then it's more or less a one-sided investigation uh, where the prosecutor's doing the investigation. I don't know why the defense lawyer is not cooperating very much, but they're not. Um, and then that just feeds more mistrust. I so think for me, it's not that they're, that they're just in name only. It's that I don't really think they know what they're doing yet. So I had, I worked with one where I think they, they probably think they're not in name only. They don't exist just to affirm the conviction. They really do want to try and do the right thing, but I don't think they have any idea yet what that means, how they should go about relooking at a case, how they can consider it. And so I'm not trustful of their, their staffing, their questions that they're asking, where they're going for information. And I'm happy to share with them all the good stuff that we have and am not eager to do their job for them. Okay, then, so that's, here, here we are. I mean, that, I don't know what the reaction of is of other people to, to that. I mean, I think the people who are on this call, certainly people running conviction integrity units have much more robust sense of how to do things. And, you know, the, those basic standards we talked about in the beginning, I think if those offices, Linda, that you're talking about had those, right, um, mm -hmm. you'd be in a different position. Like, there's good, there's good training that exists. Mark Hale, I know, goes around the country, and I think those are, many of you have participated in these sessions, right, where there's training for how to set up a conviction integrity unit, um, how to conduct a review, what the standards should be coming up with, with problems. But I think that, that that's essential if you're going to move forward to even get to the point of information sharing. I'm assuming most people on this call, we, we were assuming, actually do more information sharing um, because you have policies and practices to ensure that that's true. And so I was just pointing out the distinctions between pri privilege and confidential information. Um, so that they're, they're taking a minute from the prosecution side. Doyle? This is Doyle. 
and uh, from Prince George's County, Maryland. But, uh, you know, it's a quite, it is a question of trust, I think you put it correctly. So uh, from our side, you know, if, if we get the impression that we're being spoon fed only one piece part of the story, that's going to make us reluctant uh, to move ahead. Now, clearly, when the evidence is overwhelming, there's been misconduct and so forth, but that when we have a clear obligation to proceed no matter what. But a more trickier issue is when the evidence isn't quite, may not, there may be questions about the evidence, there may be questions about the case, uh, then I think it's an issue that has to be addressed. And, from our side, if we don't trust the defense attorney, then we're going to have a much more skeptical view of that otherwise. Now, I think the answer, and we are just setting up ours with the Atlantic Innocence Project, where we'll do joint investigations, but there will be situations where there may be information they can't share, but the expectation is we, you know. Doyle, we just lost you. I, I've got a lousy connection. Okay. Even with the direct the, the connection. But, uh, but, you know, that would be an issue that we would have to uh, pay attention to. Uh, and I think the only real answer is to talk it out. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, as you said, have, have some policies, but the devil's always in the details. You can have yeah. all the policies in the world, and it comes down to a specific case. Uh, where you know we have to be convinced, and then in turn, my job is I have to convince the state's attorney right. uh, and the judges that um, you know this is the situation. And so, if I don't, if there are things out there I don't know, uh, that would be a problem. You know, I think I totally agree with you that the de devil's in the details, but you can't have the details unless you have policies first. So you've really got to try, and it's not so simple. Like and when I was starting by talking about what kind of cases you're going to review, right? I mean, if you're going to put that out there, it's got to be something that's sufficiently general so that, you know, you, it'll deal with the exceptions, but it can't be too general such that you review every single thing that wa walks in the door. Same thing with, with, with the scope, scope of review. So I, I, I can't emphasize the importance enough, even though you know, you might think, oh, the, it's all about the details, it's all about relationships, which it is, unfortunately, at the end of the day, you still have to have, have po policies out there for people to look at. Um, you know, there are questions like, they're hard ones, like what do you do if it's a snitch that you're using in another case, your prosecutor, you've, you, the snitch has been used, you know, whatever, it's five, five or six cases, they're all cases of vi violence involved, you can't share that with, with the defense lawyer. Um, you're investigating it, but that may cause distrust when the defense lawyer says to you, tell me who this witness is. I want to understand what happened here, um, which is why, it, I mean, that's, I don't know that that's so much of a detail, but it's certainly a real life situation where if you don't have the trust among the lawyers, um, you know, it, it, it may not go anywhere because then, then that spirals and the defense lawyer doesn't want to give you information and, and we go on and on and on. So hopefully you could say in that circumstance to a reasonable good defense lawyer, look, we can't reveal the name of this person. We're using this person in a number of other cases. Let's try to figure out an alternative way to get, get the information to you. Um, so I don't know. I'd like to hear from other conviction integrity units of what, because I think this is kind of the, the information sharing piece is the nub of a lot of the problems that, 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 that exist when we hear from both sides. You know, the, the, the defense lawyers will say, prosecutors, they're not contacting us, they don't want to know our information, or they're looking at our information from a pure prosecutorial point of view, rather than an open-minded point, point of view. You know, we always say, if someone comes with some credible evidence, you need to start off as if you, are, you have yet to prosecute the person, as if you're trying to decide, should we bring this prosecution or not? Not, oh, by the way, they, they were convicted, and here's all the evidence to support it and why this piece of evidence doesn't matter anymore. So that's a mindset question. Um, there are some really good conviction integrity unit people who do that. The criticism always is from defense lawyers, oh no, they don't. Oh no, they don't. They don't really see, they, they don't see this with an open mind. So one, once again, I think it's a question of, of trust, of training, of leadership. It goes back to these 
basic points that we were making before. Marissa, you wanna add anything here about some of the information sharing questions? No, I think that the point that you made is an excellent one in terms of trying to, and I applaud my daughter is preparing for her violin lesson in the background. So you get a little musical uh -huh. you know, background for this one. Um, it, it is about like, putting those expectations up front and talking them through. And I think that a big part of this is not making assumptions of what your counterpart is doing or what their motivations are, but talking to them about it. Because from the defense lawyer's perspective, like Ellen was saying, you may assume that the prosecutor's just not looking at the case or not giving it the full weight, when in fact they are, but they have other considerations. And the same from the prosecutor side, you may think that the defense lawyer is just trying to game you by withholding information that you think you're entitled to have, but there are very real ethical considerations that they have before they can turn things over. So I think a lot of it is about laying out ahead of time what's going to be shared, how it's going to be shared, and trying to build that trust as you go through, but make sure that you have open communication so that when there's a dispute or when there's a question, you can talk about it without you know, either side kind of throwing up their hands and walking away, which makes it very easy. This is a very, very hard you know, thing to do in our adversarial system is we are trying to create cooperative and collaborative investigations which runs completely counter to everything that we've ever done. And so I, it takes patience, it takes trust, um, but I think that it really mostly takes communication, open communication. You know, and it's still counter, not that it was counter, it still is counter. I mean, I, you know, I talked to bo both sides in this thing, um, and there are defense lawyers who say, I'd never trust a prosecutor no matter what. I don't care if they think they're running a conviction integrity unit, I don't trust them. It's like, how we have to move beyond that. I don't want to sound like I'm Pollyanna-ish because I understand all, all the problems. Um, and similarly, you know, there are a lot of sleazy defense lawyers out there. I'm sorry to say, and there are not numbers of them. Those are not usually the lawyers who are bringing these cases in, unless of course they want to get the money. I mean, you have, we have a bunch of those people that, that we find who find this great case. They think it's an innocence case. And you know, they, they see the dollar signs at the end of the day. That's not the vast majority of defense lawyers doing this work. They're more like Linda. They're more like the innocence organizations that you can generally trust and the reason you can trust them is they are, you know, generally you have an organization as opposed to an individual. They have policies, they have procedures, they have goals, and they hire good people, which is to say they're hiring ethical people who are, who are good, good lawyers. But, you know, one has to deal with, as Doyle saying, the devil's in the details, and often the details are who are the people that you are dealing with. So, it's, yes, it's going it's to take a while. I mean, it, one of the problems, I think, for many, def I, I talk to defense organizations and defense lawyers about this who think I'm totally Pollyanna-ish and because they say they're in a prosecutor's office. What do you want? They're in a prosecutor's office. How can you trust them? They're in the prosecutor's office. I'm like, well, but wait a minute. Their function is totally different. They have their own issues within the prosecutor's office. As Doyle said, they have to go, they conduct an investigation, and then they have to go convince the powers that be that both their trial lawyer and their appellate lawyers were wrong. I mean, that's not easy to do, right? It's like suddenly you're taking on the institution in which you're working. Um, you know, many good state's attorneys will say, go for it, go, if you have wrongful convictions, please resolve these. But those are kind of the easy ones. If you have DNA, that's one thing. You have DNA establishing somebody didn't do it. But if you have, a, you know, a two witness ID case and you're investigating that, there are people in that office who fundamentally believe that the conviction was a righteous one, right? And the appellate lawyer believes it's righteous. And now you come in and say, well, by clear and convincing evidence, we've established it's not that person. So that's not so easy um, for, the pe for the people who are in your, your positions, I just want to say. So that one has to do more education, I think. And maybe we need, um, you know, I don't know, another generation of people within these offices to be able to see that, yes, it's possible to, co to cooperate on some, some of these. I can say one other thing about uh, conviction integrity units, even the best ones that we've worked with, and there have been many that I really like working with, um, if they're not properly resourced, they can't do the investigation. They don't have the uh, lawyers with the skill level or the time to commit to doing the real huge amount of work that can go into completely reinvestigating a very old case. So they might have the best of intentions, but just can't get to it. 
So that's true, which is why cooperation, you know, with defense lawyers who have the information could be essential. And then you're, 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 it's a chicken and egg problem. So how do you get to the point where you're willing to give them all the information you have? Um, because it certainly, it might, it might affect in the future a retrial, right? What, what's going to happen, Linda, if you turn over everything and then they go, nope, sorry, it's not an exoneration. We believe that you know, they shouldn't have been convicted of the top count but we're, we're going to go back and re retry them on another count. Well, we, I mean, so far, I, I can't think of a case where we haven't been willing to sh just show everything because we think we've got it. We think we've got the evidence of innocence and whatever else is there is there, but it doesn't really affect whether or not we think the case is worthy of their consideration and to be reviewed. Um, it's going to come up though, for sure. So uh, other questions by, by people who are running these units? I'm really curious as to information sharing issues that, that, that arise or have, have arisen for you. I, I want write, to write about this stuff. So this will be very helpful for me to hear. What, let, let's hear what, what goes on there. I've talked to Mark. Uh, this, this is Eileen O'Connor. I'm in um, New Jersey. Yes, hi, um, New Jersey. Doing a great how job. How you doing? We know you're doing a great job. So, um, you know, we're, we're just, um, our unit, which is run, I don't know if Carolyn's on, but um, um, is just a year old. And, um, and, you know, and so it's, I wouldn't say there's strict protocols on, on this particular issue. Um, obviously, the best case scenario, yeah, if you can work together. But uh, having said that, when, like an old, say an old homicide or an old case is being reinvestigated, like I don't think necessarily it's incumbent on the state to say to the defense attorney, hey, uh, we, we located witness A and we're going to next Tuesday interview him. Do you know what I mean? I don't necessarily think that needs to be done. I, I do think like if we do then, you know, speak to witness A on Tuesday afternoon, then obviously would inform the person's current attorney on the uh, post-conviction attorney, you know, we interviewed the witness and they said X, Y, Z. So it's a joint investigation, but it's not like joint, like we're all going to every interview together. And likewise, I think the defense attorney is probably, you, you, you would hope and think they're also, you know, part of the, the, the issue is, is some of these cases are probably hard to get the witnesses and talk to them when they happened 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So it's like 20 times harder now. But, you know, so when you say information sharing, yeah, but I don't know, you know, it's a, it, it's, it's just a, it's a walk we're walking on now and we're, we're learning it as we go, obviously. But I think when we're talking about information sharing, it's generally thought of as the results of that information, not necessarily saying, go out and conduct the interview together. On the other hand, as I hear you talk, I can see, look, everybody conducts their, their, in their, their interview in such a way to kind of get, in, get information out. And it may be that there's some kind of cognitive bias that whoever's conduct the police or whoever has when they're asking questions. So I could see if it's a key witness, you might wanna say, let's do this together so we can make sure that we're getting all the facts out in a way that doesn't come out and seem biased. Because you then run into problems. So let's say prosecutor uh, interviews the, or their inve investigator, the police, right? Usually goes and interviews that person on their own. You turn that over to the defense lawyer. They say, "What? Do you, that's not what happened. I mean, let, let, let's ask about X, Y, Z, Q, R, N, right? And they go out and they interview that same person and they get not contrary, but amplifying information that may, may make a difference. So this is hard. I'm not suggesting at all that there be some protocol about the, the, you know, the, the kumbaya of doing these things together. That isn't the point. It just means you have to define what we mean by information sharing and it probably di differs by case. Is that, what do you, what do you think of that? Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's, it's not, you know, the, I don't think there's like a hard and fast rule for the same thing on every case, every, you know, attorney. It's just, it's, it's, it is a unique and more collaborative investigative way of doing things. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, I, like I said, I don't think it's, it's, you know, you're walking hand in hand.
Well, so, you know, what's interesting about, about your question to me? Or what, you know, what's interesting least, about, about your question to me? Or what, what, what just happened? Echo, right? Yeah. Well, Echo, right? Is that on my end? I think it's on my end, yes? Is that on my end? I think it's on my end, yes? Uh-oh. I haven't moved. I haven't touched a thing, so I don't know why this is happening. Huh. Now, can you hear me? Yes? I can hear you. Oh, okay. All right. It's, it's not, not an echo. You know, the, the adversary, look, we, we still are in an adversary system. Even if you are a former defense lawyer and now you've gone to run a conviction integrity unit, um, you're going to have your investigators still most likely be the police going out to ask questions. Police are going to, as I said, they're going to ask questions differently than a defense inv investigator might allow. The defense investigator also is probably a former police officer too. So that's the part of the adversary system that I think we need to think more about as we figure out how to conduct these investigations because these the fact I'm, I'm hearing my own yes I'm hearing. now that stopped uh, marissa maybe because you have me as co-host maybe you had yours off i don't know i do not know what yes when you have your mute off when you have your mute on i think it's working fine okay sorry so uh, to me, that's a very, I don't know what I think of. I think it's a really interesting qu question. You, when you, you, the overlay of the adversary process of gathering information with the fact that you're trying to operate co collaboratively. I think that's a really hard question. So I, I would agree with you that generally you're going to do your own investigation. It's your responsibility to do the investigation, right? Um, so you, and you want to take, take control of it as well but it's sort of a dance as to when it is, you're gonna say, uh, maybe I'm missing something here. I don't think most people think in those terms. You're in charge. You're not thinking I'm missing anything. You're being thorough. But that, that was good. Thank you for raising that. Other, other concerns, questions? Oh, Doyle, I can see you now. Uh, we're coming up on our regular stop time. So that's what I just put that in. So we have, it's um, just about 3.10 now, so we still have about five minutes left, but just wanted to highlight for folks, I know we want to be very respectful of your time, especially these days. So just to note that if there are questions or issues or things you want to address right now in, the, in a big group, this is the time to do it. I didn't, you know, we didn't deal with the, with the pro se question. Uh, Marissa, you're going to distribute to them um, the the uh, what 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 do we call it? The protocols, I think you're calling them for dealing with with pro se people. These are people who come to you who are not represented by counsel. So first of all, I think you're all aware of the ethics rules that you make. You have to make clear who you are. That you can't indicate you're disinterested when you reasonably should know they misunderstand your role. You have to make efforts to correct that. You can't give them legal advice, and that and that makes it really hard. Other than the advice to secure counsel if your interests are in conflict with their interests. So it's important to have protocols, notifications, send them a letter. Once again, you're gonna explain this business of confidential information and waiver. And it's really important to explain that really clearly. You may figure out how to provide them assistance in securing counsel. You know, I think it, as ju judges would say, they always like dealing with a lawyer rather than with a pro se person. And I suspect the same is relatively true if you're in a conviction integrity unit looking into someone's case, you really don't want them calling you every other day and sending you all kinds of extraneous information. So it would be good if you could, if there are ways to get, get, them, get them a lawyer. So, right. And what Ellen's talking about is you know, for conviction integrity units, not just innocence organizations. Because right. so I'm, mo yeah. I'm mo mostly talking about conviction integrity units. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because prosecutors have that added burden of not just trying to be respectful of the person who's writing to you, but you want to make sure that they are aware that they're working with prosecutors, that you're not their lawyers, you're not there to give them information or advice, you know, because heaven forbid you know, things turn around and then down the line, you, you're being told that you, they were talking to you under false pretenses or you weren't up front. So we want to make sure that what's being sent out from prosecutors' offices is as you giving them as much information as you can about exactly how this relationship will work. 
you know, some of them, believe it or not, still think you are their lawyer. I mean, that, you know, that's really hard because you're, if you're the person they're talking to and the only person they're talking to, um, and they're giving all this confidential information to you, right? They, they may be thinking you're my lawyer, so you have to make clear. And just putting it in writing once is probably not, not enough. It's important to say it more, more than once. So th these are just the guidelines. This is for defense counsel. So the same is true for, for, for um, prosecutor's offices. And th these are just the various resources of things you might want to take a look at if you love re reading reports and law, law review articles. Um, and, and no, but e even if you don't, there's actually, we wrote these so that there's some uh, helpful and useful um, gu guidelines in there. So questions, comments? Is it, is it ethically appropriate for a prosecutor to um, elicit a waiver from a pro se defendant? Wouldn't that be in the nature of giving legal advice? Well, if you're, if you're giving them legal information, which we make this distinction that is often a distinction without a difference, then, then you're permitted to do that. What we mean by legal information is that you just tell them what the law is. You don't tell them, you don't give them legal advice based on that information. So um, you would have to do it, do it carefully, but you have to do it. If they're pro se, they're coming in to give you information. If you explain to them, as, as, as Marissa she points out, the consequences of what it means to be confidential information, that it can be used against them, um, in, in the future. That's not legal advice. That, that's considered le legal information. But it's a great question. I don't know if you do that. Do you do that currently? Uh, well, I'm not d directly involved at this point. I, I did have a, a, a different question, though. And that is, you seem to indicate earlier, Ellen, that uh, the defense lawyer or the Innocence Project can disclose confidential information without the same kind of uh, knowing an intelligent waiver that would be required for the disclosure of attorney-client privilege communications. No, I'm sorry if that was the impression I left. No, the rule, I, I, that's why I cited the rule first. You have to have client consent to do either one, one of those. Confidential information is like the big circle and attorney-client privilege is a small one. You always have to have way, way a waiver before you turn over any information. That's, good. that's it. Other comments, questions? Okay, I will note that it is uh, 3.15, our usual stopping time. As I said, we will make this PowerPoint available with the recording, as well as links to the um, resources that Ellen put up on her slide so that you have all those. Um, I just, Ellen needs to say thank you so very much well, for diving into helpful. this. Was this helpful? People find this helpful. I'd, lo I'd love to get some feedback because actually like I said, I, I do want to write something that's useful for people that's more than just putting up general policies and pro protocols. So I'd like to identify what some of the key pro problems are that we haven't looked at yet. So, so I absolutely encourage folks to write back to us. Um, you know, if you had issues that you've kind of been trying to figure out or deal with, please reach out to us and we will um, help work that through. That's part of what we're here for. And um, just to keep in mind that net we'll, we have a webinar scheduled for same time, two, two o'clock Eastern time on the second Wednesday of the month um, going forward. So we'll be sending out that information too. If you're getting too many emails from me, let me know. If you're not getting enough, happy to write more of those too. But just want to say thank you very much. Oh, and feel free to contact me, me with any questions. I'll put my phone number and email on top, top of the slides. And this is terrific. Keep up the good work. I mean, it's really impressive. And you're often in a very difficult position. I, I know that, but um, it's encouraging. It's encouraging. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks so Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.